Good evening. I'm Dr. Al Peters. I'm the medical director for the Scheer Institute for Reproductive Medicine in New Jersey. Welcome to the webinar, and I hope that this is the first of a series of webinars that we will do on infertility topics and reproductive failure topics. So I'm going to go through a basic uh, lecture on infertility, and uh, at the end, um, or close to the end, you'll be prompted to send in questions if you'd like, and I will take each of those questions and review them uh, at the end of my lecture. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right. As a, a basic overview of infertility, infertility in general is the inability to conceive uh, after a couple has been trying for about a year. So what does this mean practically? This doesn't mean that if a patient comes into the office and uh, she's been trying for six months that we'll turn her away and say, go keep trying in, until a year has passed, particularly for those women who are over 35, because as women age, there really is a biologic clock and there's a condition we call diminished ovarian reserve. As women get older, their egg quality goes down. So if we could learn this early and start preparing for their management, that will give them a better chance of getting pregnant. Another term I just want you to be familiar with is a term called human fecundity. Fecundity is the ability of a human to get pregnant on a given month. In general, human reproduction is a rather inefficient process. So even at peak fertility, which is somewhere around age 21 and 22, um, fertility is rather low. We generally talk about fecundity under the age of 30. It's only about 25% per month. Why is this important? Because when we're prescribing therapy for patients, they have to be able to compare it to something. If we're doing, for example, a Clomid cycle, perhaps with IUI, and I suggest that the pregnancy rate is only gonna be maybe somewhere between 10 and 15%, that sounds pretty awful to a couple, but if they understand that even in the best of conditions, peak fertility is only somewhere in the range of 20 to 25 percent, that makes that therapy a little more uh, understandable, the success rate for that therapy a little more understandable. So to put this in perspective, uh, infertility affects about 12 percent of the reproductive age couples. That translates into about 7 million couples in the United States. And we can break fertility up into, infertility up into several categories. Clearly the largest category is male factor. So a semen analysis is probably one of the first tests that we want to get on a couple. Upwards of 40% of uh, the reasons for infertility are due to some factor uh, that is related to sperm. <clears throat> Another uh, large uh, possibility are pelvic factors, tubal factors, blockage of the fallopian tubes. That can come from a number of possibilities, pelvic adhesions, endometriosis, previous surgery, any type of infection that occurred in the pelvis, such as pelvic inflammatory disease, any type of inflammation that occurred in the pelvis, ruptured appendix. Ovulation issues account for another roughly 25% of infertility. And then if you read most textbooks and talk to most experts, they will say there's an unexplained uh, infertility which can compromise, uh, comprise of about 10%. Uh, in reality, um, there's probably always a reason for infertility if we look deep enough. Okay, so when a couple first comes in to speak with me, um, I have a large whiteboard in my office over on the wall, and I actually draw this circle. And in that circle, I divide it up into three parts, and I talk about the three most important things that we want to look at as to why this couple might not be getting pregnant. We want to look at egg factors and ask the question, do we have good egg quality? We want to look at sperm factors. Do we have good sperm quality? And are the fallopian tubes intact so that can, uh, can the egg and sperm indeed meet each other? And if we can go through this type of uh, workup, we know we're doing a good job for this couple and we're not going to miss anything. So this is a very general workup. This, this clearly does not involve all possible fertility testing, but it's a good place to start. It's a good basic infertility workup. So usually the first place I start is with sperm. Now sometimes it's a little hard to get the gentleman to come in for a semen analysis. Most guys are a little intimidated by that, a little embarrassed, but it really is one of the most important tests that we, that we do. 
And when I sit down and talk with the guys and I, and I really explain uh, a lot of the invasive things that their wives or partners are going to have to undergo, most of them will come in willingly and do this. And we get a lot of information from this test. We next want to look at egg quality, and there's multiple tests for this. Most of them are blood tests, which are very important, such as a follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, anti-mullerian hormone, AMH. We also want to look at the patient metabolically and look at her thyroid function. We oftentimes find problems here, and a good screening test for that is thyroid-stimulating hormone. Prolactin. Prolactin is the hormone that allows breastfeeding to occur in women after they have a baby. And sometimes, for various reasons, this hormone could be elevated and that can affect the way ovulation occurs. It can also affect the quality of the implantation status of the endometrium. Estradiol is the hormone that the ovary produces. It's a good overview hormone to look at in women trying to get pregnant. And then there are some of the simpler uh, tests that you could do at home, such as a basal body temperature chart and ovulation kit testing. These are clearly done mostly before the patients get to someone like myself, but these are good simple tests that can be done at home to assure or give someone a reasonable assurance that they're ovulating. And then once those two things are done, then we want to go to uh, looking at the pelvis and asking the question, can the egg and sperm meet? Has to do with tubal patency. Are the fallopian tubes open? There are several tests for this. The, probably the simplest one to do is something called a hysterosalpingogram or HSG. This is an x-ray study that's done either by the gynecologist or the radiologist or the reproductive endocrinologist where a small amount of dye or contrast is put into the uterine cavity and it's tracked on x-ray to see if it can go up and spill out through the fallopian tubes just to make sure that egg and sperm can find each other. If an abnormality is found on an HSG or we're concerned about other deeper problems then sometimes a surgical procedure known as a laparoscopy can be done. So typically I start with a semen analysis and this just gives you some ideas of what sperm parameters can be. Um, back in 2009 or 2010, the uh, parameters were changed a little bit. I'm, I put both of them up here and we're clinically using this uh, second column now uh, where the volume of a semen analysis, anything above 1.5 milliliters is considered normal. Concentration, this is how many sperm per milliliter are present and anything above 15 million per milliliter should be good. Motility should be at, uh, at or above 32%, so you at least want to see 32% of the sperm swimming around looking for eggs. And morphology. Morphology is the shape of the sperm cells. Uh, a sperm must be perfectly shaped to enter the egg, and we at least want to see 4%. That's considered a strict criteria of the sperm be normal uh, to assure decent uh, fertility. Okay. This gets a little bit into uh, some of the deeper aspects of the fertility testing for egg quality. <clears throat> Remember we said that ovulatory problems can occur up to 25% of patients. This doesn't always mean that a patient doesn't ovulate or has irregular periods. We could be dealing with egg quality problems, and that's called diminished ovarian reserve. It's probably one of the most common reasons for fertility issues in the older age groups, uh, getting closer to the later 30s and early 40s, but this can be found uh, even in some of the younger age groups. I have some patients in their mid-20s who are showing signs of diminished ovarian reserve. So basically their eggs are <clears throat> acting older than their chronologic age. So one of the first tests, the most commonly known one, is FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. This is done on day three of the menstrual cycle. It's a, a hormone that's produced by the pituitary gland. And our threshold is 10 milli international units per ml. We want to keep that level low. That means the brain is not working very hard to keep the eggs uh, generating each month. So in general, the lower this level, the better. We don't want to see levels above 10. I personally prefer the AMH, which is called the anti-mullerian hormone. AMH is actually produced in the cells that surround the egg. So this is a more direct marker for egg quality. And so in this uh, regard, the higher the level, the better, within reason. So in general, we like to keep this one above 0.5. Ideally, I see the best results when it's above 2. Now, there are exceptions to every rule. There are some patients uh, who have a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome. Some of you may have that who are watching. And we generally see very high AMHs in this group of patients. 
This doesn't always mean that their eggs are the best quality. It's, it's more a function of the polycystic ovary syndrome. Estradiol, this is done on day three. Ideally, you want to see that low in the beginning part of the cycle, generally lower than 75 picograms per milliliter. Um, and then there are metabolic issues, as I mentioned before. Thyroid function, prolactin, and these can induce uh, abnormalities in, in ovulation or endometrial receptivity. Uh, so we, we want to make sure that we at least look at these in all patients uh, undergoing fertility evaluation. Now, by the time patients get to me, we're not generally doing basal body temperature charts anymore or ovulation kits, but there are pretty good assessments that you can do at home just to make sure that uh, you are ovulating and the timing of ovulation, and this can help you with the targeting of timed intercourse when you're trying to get pregnant. The basal body temperature chart uh, is done by taking, the woman takes her temperature as soon as she gets up in the morning, before she moves around, before she brushes her teeth, uh, has a drink of coffee or water, because any of those things can change the temperature of an oral uh, thermometer. And ideally, we're looking for very small changes in temperature. So on the, on the basal body temperature, you're looking for a rise in the temperature, but actually ovulation occurs right before that. And I think I have an example coming up on the next slide. Ovulation kit testing is probably a little more precise. This is your, usually a urinary test. Um, and a, a little dipstick, and it tells you if there's a surge in a hormone called LH, which is the sister hormone to FSH, also from the pituitary gland. And about 24 hours prior to ovulation, the LH will rise. You can pick that up in a kit. So this is more of a prospective test, and that's why I like this one a little bit better. The basal body temperature chart, uh, usually when that rise goes off or up, the ovulation has already occurred. So, you know, sort of the horse is out of the barn by that point. This is kind of a, just a graphic representation of a temperature chart. Any of those, any of those, of any of you who have done this, excuse me, uh, know that each day you take your temperature and you'll see these up and down variations. But right at the point of ovulation, there's usually a dip. We call this the trough, and then soon thereafter, the temperature rises and it usually stays up. One of two things actually happens. If it stays up, you can be pregnant, and this is a result of a thermogenic shift on the hypothalamus from progesterone, which is produced in the second half of the menstrual cycle uh, from the corpus luteum, which is the sac from which the egg came. If uh, pregnancy has not occurred, then the progesterone drops, and the temperature will drop, and at the bottom of that temperature fall, then the, um, or the progesterone fall, then uh, immenses will occur. Okay. So moving on to the third part of our workup, uh, can the egg and sperm meet? And this could imply that there might be a tubal factor. There could be blocked fallopian tubes. This can occur up to about 35% of patients who are experiencing infertility. And this could be secondary to things that are structural, endometriosis, pelvic adhesions, past pelvic inflammation, anything that could block or crimp the fallopian tubes. So an HSG is a good place to start. It's a simple test done in the radiology department. The woman lies uh, on her back, a small a speculum is placed in the vagina, a small little catheter or tube is placed in the cervix, and we inject very gently a small amount of radiodense contrast dye. We then watch that dye go up through the uterus and spill out through the fallopian tubes, and it at least tells us there's patency. It doesn't mean that the pelvis is perfect. It doesn't mean that there's no endometriosis or no adhesions, or, or it doesn't even tell us if there are cysts on the ovaries or fibroids in the uterus. It just tells us that there is uh, an openness to the fallopian tubes that potentially eggs and sperm can get through <clears throat> and meet each other. So uh, this next slide shows an example of an HSG. You could see the little catheter coming up into the cervix. This triangular area here is the uterus. And then you see these small little spaghetti strings coming off the uterus. These are the fallopian tubes. And then toward the distal third of the tube, it widens somewhat like a funnel, and then you could see the dye spilling out here into the pelvis. So this would be a normal hysterosalpingogram. When we find abnormalities on a hysterosalpingogram, uh, or we have suspicions of other things, like endometriosis, ovarian cyst, someone who comes in with chronic pelvic pain that's undiagnosed, then we might want to move to a laparoscopy. And this is a surgical procedure. It's generally fairly minor. Uh, the patient will go into the hospital, usually in the morning,
comes out the same day. There's a small incision at the belly button and maybe one or two other incisions on the lower part of the pelvis through which little instruments can be placed to manipulate pelvic organs. And this will give us much more information. We can then put dye through the fallopian tubes and actually visualize it uh, coming out through the tubes, uh, through the telescope that we can look at. This is actually projected up on a large screen. And we can also determine if the patient has endometriosis. If we find something at that point, we can actually fix it uh, right at that moment. If there's cysts on the ovaries, we can remove those. We can sometimes remove fibroids from the uterus. So this is a very useful test uh, as, as a diagnostic test, but it's also a treatment uh, uh, in addition. But it's a surgery, and there are risk factors with surgery, such as infection, bleeding, injury to organs. So it's not a first-line test that we want uh, to do. So after the basic workup is done, we then have to um, come up with a treatment plan for our patients. And uh, really, treatment options are really a, a lecture unto their own, uh, but at least I can give you some basic information about these. And typically, we try to uh, start in a stepwise approach. So uh, ovulation induction might be a very basic thing. This, this would be a treatment that would be useful for someone who doesn't ovulate or ovulates irregularly. And typically we try to start with the simple drugs. Uh, and the simplest one we can use is something called Clomid. Clomid is an oral medication. It's taken usually in, in the early part of the menstrual cycle for about five days. We then do some monitoring with ultrasounds, wait for the egg to grow, and then when that egg or eggs get to a certain point, we trigger release with a hormone called HCG or Ovidrel, and then either timed intercourse happens after that or artificial insemination, which we call IUI, intrauterine insemination. So if Clomid is ineffective or doesn't work, and there are some patients that it might be ineffective for, we then move to the next level of medications, and these are injectable drugs. These are called gonadotropins. So earlier I mentioned two hormones, uh, one called FSH and one called LH. We're gon well, gonadotropins are basically recombinant or genetically engineered um, forms of FSH and LH, which in turn stimulate the ovary. We're just giving them in a very concentrated form in a concentrated number of days, and this will help us generate multiple follicles or multiple eggs at the same time. So these are very effective medications, but they're very powerful. And one of the concerns we have to always be thinking about and talking to patients about is the risk of multiples. If we generate five eggs, that's a potential ovulation of five eggs, which could be fertilized. And uh, this is where we can potentially see high order multiples. So these have to be used uh, with you know, uh, much care and uh, someone who has a good understanding of these drugs um, to keep them safe for our patients. When there is a mild to moderate male factor, sometimes we can use intrauterine insemination. That's where we take the husband's sperm, we process it, we do a semen analysis on it, and then we take out the bad sperm and keep the good sperm. They're separated out through a centrifugation process and a washing process. And then we take the best sperm in the sample and uh, we insert that back into the uterus through the cervix, relatively painless procedure. Uh, we do that at the exact time that ovulation is occurring uh, because we made that happen with our shot to release the eggs. And then um, we wait to see if the patient's pregnant. It takes uh, about 10 days, 10 to 12 days to see the results of that. And we have the patient do a pregnancy test. When those methods fail or the reason uh, for infertility is overwhelming to those types of uh, treatments, we then move into in vitro fertilization. And the beauty of in vitro fertilization is it has very high pregnancy rates, relatively low multiple rates because now we're at the point where we could put a single embryo in with very good success. But the key thing about in vitro is that it bypasses most problems. If there's a tubal problem, we bypass it because we're going to remove the eggs from the body, fertilize them in the laboratory with sperm, and then create the embryo and put embryos back into the uterus. If there's a male factor problem, we're going to actually select the sperm that's used. So we're going to pick the best sperm that we could find in the entire ejaculate. So there are a lot of reasons where in vitro fertilization is helpful because we could bypass certain problems that occur in 
in the body, uh, in the pelvis. In vitro fertilization can also be used to genetically test embryos. So if we have someone who's recurrently miscarrying or perhaps has a genetic issue in their family that they don't want to pass on, we could test these embryos genetically so we know whether these embryos are normal female or normal male before we put them back into the uterine cavity. I think I would be uh, a bit remiss if I didn't at least mention the psychological aspects of infertility. Um, I see this every day and, I, and patients don't really need to tell me that they're experiencing this. I could see it on their face. I could see it in the body language that they have. Uh, and infertility does cause a significant emotional stress on our couples. It leads to depression. It leads to anger, anxiety, marital discord. I've even seen couples who sometimes blame each other uh, for the, the, the woman not getting pregnant. Uh, if it's a sperm problem, sometimes the wife will blame the husband. If it's an egg problem or diminished ovarian reserve, the husband will blame the wife. But we try to not put this on any individual. We treat infertility as a couple's problem. And um, I do try to address these, these type of things with couples, especially if they tell me about it, or sometimes I just notice the body language and I'll at least bring this up. And couples actually appreciate that and they feel a weight has been lifted just to bring up the, the discussion. Um, when it gets beyond my abilities, and sometimes it does, um, I refer. And I have certain counselors and therapists that, are, that specialize in reproductive failure who can be uh, very helpful uh, to these couples. And if you don't bring it up and don't talk about it, We'll, we never know if it is a problem in a given couple. So it's important that you talk to your doctor about that if you're feeling that. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking at this point and uh, leave some time for uh, you folks uh, to ask me some questions. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me look at these uh, here at this point. Before I do that, I'm going to uh, switch here to a different mode. Just bear with me for a second. Okay, so the first question, uh, I did an IUI last cycle, uh, natural, no Clomid or Femera uh, or trigger shot. My ovulation predictor kit was positive the next morning of day 14. The IUI was the next morning, which was day 15. Could that have been too long after ovulation? Okay. So this is a good question. It gets it gets down to you know basic physiology of when the when the egg is released and when sperm should get there. So uh, typically, an ovulation predictor kit is going to predict ovulation about 24 hours in advance. The best recommendation um, I give patients is once that kit turns positive, the next day have intercourse for the next two days. So if the kit turns positive today then tomorrow and the next day you should have intercourse. The egg is probably the more fragile of the cells here. Um, once an egg ovulates, its peak survival is about 36 hours. So uh, from the time of uh, the ovulation predictor kit goes off, you have 24 hours till that egg is released, and then the next 48 hours, I think, in my opinion, is the best time um, to have, uh, have intercourse. So I hope that's helpful. We can, we can get that a little bit more precise when, um, uh, when we use uh, ultrasounds and we release the egg with Ovidrel or HCG. But if you're doing it on your own, that's probably uh, the best advice I can give. Okay, let me see if we have some other questions here. Okay. So this one is, I'm 40 years old, should I go straight to IVF? <laughs> it's actually a good question. Um, maybe, not necessarily. Um, IVF is clearly always the best way to get pregnant. It's the most efficient way to become pregnant. Um, but if just because you're 40 doesn't necessarily mean you I need IVF. So I think the best thing to do is to go back and do some of the basic things that we talked about check a semen analysis, check an AMH and an FSH, make sure the ovarian reserve uh, is still good, um, make sure the fallopian tubes are patent. I think the key thing to take away from here is at 40, you don't want to waste time. 
So if you are going to try some lesser therapies like Clomid, like IUI, give yourself a limit. Your doctor should be telling you this. Maybe two or three cycles, and if you're not pregnant, then yes, strongly consider moving on to more aggressive means. Okay. Our next question, um, I've had two miscarriages and, a, and an ectopic. Should I expect uh, going through, should I expect to go through in vitro fertilization? Um, the ectopics concern me. Typically, if an ectopic occurs, there's something wrong with the fallopian tube. And if there's something wrong with one, there's a very good chance there could be something wrong with the other fallopian tube. So for that reason, I would at least consider in vitro, especially if you're over 35. The miscarriage issue is also an important issue. And there are, uh, obviously I didn't go through the entire process uh, or the entire workup for um, miscarriages. There's a whole uh, uh, concept of recurrent pregnancy loss and that would actually be a good topic for a webinar some evening, and I will do that. But uh, you want to make sure that all the conditions exist so that a, a pregnancy can be carried to term. And there are, there are various factors, uh, anatomic factors, endocrine factors, immunologic factors. And, and immunologic factors are not looked at in many programs, so ask your doctor about that. Uh, can my immune system possibly be rejecting my embryo? and you might hear, well, we don't believe in that, or that doesn't exist, then you want to ask him why he doesn't believe in it and find a doctor who does and go see them. But, um, so yes, we want to look at all those factors and then let that, let that be the guide to move on to in vitro fertilization. Um, <clears throat> another question is, is FSH or AMH more important? I actually think they're both important. Um, in my personal practice, I oftentimes find um, FSH is normal and the AMH will be low. So I don't want to just rely on an FSH. Years ago that's all we had, but with the developing assays for AMH, um, I really do believe it's a more sensitive test. So if I find a normal AMH and a low, uh, excuse me, if I find a normal FSH and a low AMH, I treat the low AMH. So I treat those individuals for uh, diminished ovarian reserve? That's a very good question, and, and I would act quickly once we start seeing those, uh, those problems. Okay, so um, one other question here. I have PCO and no other issues when tested. I've tried IVF one time and had a miscarriage at five weeks. Uh, will I have any issues with miscarriage again uh, if I try with a frozen embryo transfer? This is an excellent question, and the fact that this patient has uh, gotten to the point of in vitro fertilization, I'm assuming, and I shouldn't always do that, that a good workup has been done with regard to implantation. But one of the things I would definitely encourage this individual uh, to ask their doctor about is immune testing. I'm assuming that they've looked at your uterus and there's no fibroids, there's no polyps, obvious things, thyroid function is good. Um, but you want it to look at the immune system and ask the question, could there be any rejection going on? And when you look at the immune system, there are various aspects. You want to look at uh, the autoimmune system. That would involve a series of tests called antiphospholipid antibodies. And you want to do a test called a natural killer cell assay. And this will give you a good assessment of what's happening. These tests are rather detailed, and this could be another topic for another seminar. But uh, please ask your doctor about those, and if they don't do that test or don't believe in those tests, then uh, give us a call and we can do those tests for you. Uh, one other question, this might be the last one. Um, how important is morphology on a semen analysis? I think morphology is a very important test because that uh, looks at the, um, the shape of the sperm. And we know from basic physiology that the shape of a sperm must be perfect for that sperm to penetrate through the egg membrane. So if there are any variations or irregularities to that sperm surface, that sperm's not going to fertilize. The best way to get around that is to do in vitro fertilization where we can actually pick up a perfect sperm and inject it into the egg. That process is called ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So that is a very important um, uh, test and I encourage you to talk to your doctors about that. 
There are some supplements that men can be on that might improve that, but morphology defects are very difficult to deal with without in vitro fertilization, particularly when they get down below 4%. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions on here um, at this point. Uh, let me just make sure that we don't. And we'll, we'll make sure that there are no other questions before we sign off. But I want to thank everybody for uh, attending tonight. And um, uh, we'll, we will post future seminars or webinars, and I hope you will attend the future ones. Looks like we have two other questions. Yes. Okay. So I have an assistant trying to find out if there are two other questions, if you just give me a minute uh, to do that. Um, I'll expand a little bit on uh, immunology since we got a couple of questions that actually uh, uh, we're, we're getting into that. Um, keep in mind that when an embryo is in a uterus, uh, that embryo is uh, made up of cells from the mother and the father. It's half cells from the mother and half cells from the father. But the maternal immune system must look at that embryo and decide whether that embryo is acceptable to stay there. And when it's looking at the maternal half of the of that embryo, that's the autoimmune system. The mother is looking at herself. When it's looking at the paternal half of the embryo, that's called alloimmunity. It's looking at the other. So both of those must be satisfied for that embryo to be allowed to stay there. And that that allowance of staying in the uterus is mediated through killer cells. So you hear me talking about killer cell assays. And that's probably one of the first tests that we want to do as a good overview to determine if there's an immunologic problem. So just something to keep in mind uh, for failed reproduction. These might not be tests that you do on a first visit or part of a basic workup, and that's why they didn't include it in this slide set. But there are some questions coming through that would make that an appropriate uh, test to do. Uh, let me see here uh, what else we have. Um, any natural supplements that you recommend to improve egg quality or diminished ovarian reserve? Uh, another very good question. I'm seeing a lot of patients who want to approach um, things as natural as possible, or sometimes they just want to use um, some more holistic approaches in, in and along with the more advanced treatments that we do. So uh, one of the things that we could look at for diminished ovarian reserve is um, a supplement called CoQ10, or um, uh, ubiquinol. And there have been some studies out that have shown that there might be some beneficial effects on, on aging eggs. Keep in mind that we can't reverse aging. If someone has diminished ovarian reserve, it, they have diminished ovarian reserve. We're not going to reverse the fact that they're 40 years old or 42 years old. However, not all eggs age at the same time. So when I do an IVF cycle on a 40-year-old, I'm going to get a bell-shaped curve. There's going to be some good eggs, there's going to be maybe a lot of bad eggs, and there'll be some average eggs. As they get older, that bell shifts to the left, where they're going to incorporate more bad-looking eggs or bad-quality eggs, poor-quality eggs under that curve. So using a supplement isn't going to shift that. But what it will do, perhaps, is put those aging eggs in a better environment. So if some of those eggs are better than others and they're still sitting in the ovary, it's going to allow them to sit in a better place until they get utilized. And that's the way I look at supplements. But I do prescribe CoQ10 for patients, and uh, it's certainly not going to hurt to be on that. Um, one other here. What are the odds of getting pregnant with one fallopian tube and two ovaries? Okay, so. This patient actually either has had a tube removed or has a damaged fallopian tube and wants to know what are the odds of getting pregnant. So ovulation, I think the first thing to understand here is that ovulation is not an alternating event. And a lot of people think it is. They think one month it's on the right ovary, the next month it's on the left ovary, and it goes back and forth. It doesn't happen like that. Ovulation is a random event. So it might occur on an alternating basis. But it may also occur two or three times on the left, then it may go back to the right, it may go back to the left for a month, and then go to the right for several months. You just can't predict. So the fact that you at least have one open fallopian tube is a good thing. 
So when ovulation is occurring on the side, call it the ipsilateral or the same side that the fallopian tube is patent, you should have the same chances of getting pregnant as anyone else does in your age group, assuming that that fallopian tube is good. One of my concerns is, however, why, why is the other fallopian tube not functional? Was it removed because of an ectopic pregnancy? Was it exposed to pelvic inflammatory disease? And could that, uh, whatever that uh, uh, inciting event that blocked that tube, could that have done some damage to the existing tube? It may still be open, but the fallopian tube may not be very functional. Keep in mind, a fallopian tube is a very complicated organ. Um, it's not just a, a pipe. It's not just a duct work for an egg and sperm to go through. The inside of a fallopian tube is very complex. It has millions and millions of tiny little hair cells called cilia. These hair cells beat back and forth, and that's what actually propels the embryo after conception occurs in the tube to be pushed back into the uterus for hopeful implantation. So if those little hair cells are not functioning and they can easily get damaged with any type of inflammation, then even though that tube is present on an ovulating side where the ovary is, there still may be some problems. Okay, so I don't see any other questions. I uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. They were great questions. I hope to have more of these uh, webinars, uh, probably with more complex uh, uh, topics. As we, as we continue to go, and uh, I hope you will join us in the future. Thank you so much, and I want to thank uh, the people here that have supported me. Uh, Tom Anderson in, a, in our Las Vegas um, office did a lot of work to, to get me up and running here. Uh, I have a couple of people here, Tracy and Brenda, who were really awesome in monitoring this and sending questions to me, so I just want to thank all the people that make it possible for us to do this. Hang on, there one, maybe one last question here. Um, oh, it was just a thank you. <laughs> a thank you saying, thank you for your time, Dr. Peters. This has been very helpful, and I appreciate it, and uh, that's what makes me keep doing this. Thank you so much. Have a great night.